Uh, hi, yep. Rhino Monkey. Uh, continuing uh, with the uh, 1971. Uh, this is, uh, as you as you might recall, if you watched the last one, I, I decided so many good records in '71. I uh, I decided to split my top tens into uh, British and Irish and into uh, North American. So this week it's my North American uh, top ten, and that's not to say there weren't any good stuff coming outside of Britain, Ireland, and North America. Obviously there was. Um, I mean the the kraut rock sort of scene was beginning to start up, but um, I, haven't, I haven't actually got any of those early uh, German ones or European ones on uh, on vinyl anyway. So anyway, back to the uh, the job at hand, and as usual, uh, a, a very difficult uh, task. And these are just some of the ones that didn't make the cut that I really wanted and expected them to be in there. And uh, first of all, the band, their fourth album, Cahoots, which wasn't really that critically acclaimed but actually when I've listened to this and it's not my go-to band album I tend to go to their first two albums but really enjoyed listening to this this week it's uh, it's a superb album even though the band were on the edge of breaking up and everything but great album Cahoots. Curtis Mayfield's um, follow-up to Curtis which I featured last time a couple of weeks ago um, almost as good didn't quite make the cut this is a great album, this is The Supremes and The Four Tops, The Return of the Magnificent Seven. Um, two great bands and um, perhaps this is, I think they did three or maybe even four collaboration albums and this is this is the best one, but uh, yeah, great album. Janis Joplin's Pearl, great lovely blues uh, album, didn't quite make it. Staying with the theme of blues, this is uh, this is one that actually spans across the Atlantic because this is Jimmy Witherspoon with uh, Eric Burden. Um, great picture of Eric Burden in the middle. I won't uh, show you this. We're going to get on to my top ten, but uh, that's guilty. Good record, but not quite in my top ten. The Captain, Beefheart, Miraman, four extended sort of bluesy jams. Uh, they're good again, good album, but not quite in the top ten. I loved this band at the time, Mountain, um, Leslie West, Felix Papaladi, Corky Lamb, uh, and this is Nantucket Sleigh Ride. Um, yeah, good album, but not quite in the top ten. And then this guy, uh, this is the theme from Shaft. So uh, this is uh, a soundtrack from the film Shaft, Isaac Hayes. We had two albums in... Uh, out in 1971, both of them brilliant, um, and I'll talk about the other one maybe in a little bit. So, on to my top 10 from North America for 1971, and at number 10, this is the Beach Boys Surfs Up. Um, really dark sort of cover, um, and a dark album in some ways. I mean, I think the Beach Boys were really struggling at this point. Um, I think Brian Wilson particularly was in a bad place, uh, mental health wise and everything. Um, and this album, of course, is nothing to do with surfing. There's some sort of irony in the in the title. And um, in fact, Brian Wilson collaborated with Van Dyke Parks, that great songwriter, to uh, to write the title track on this. But uh, I really like some of their early '70s stuff. This and uh, Holland, I think, was a little bit later. Um, really nice stuff. Uh, I love the first two tracks, "Don't Go Near the Water" and "Long Promised Road." But the highlight of this album is the last three tracks, the three Brian Wilson songs at the end, which show that, struggling as he might have been, uh, he was still capable of writing beautiful, beautiful music. Um, uh, a Day in the Life of a Tree, a little bit weird, but still beautiful to listen to. Till I Die, and the title track surfs up, just absolutely gorgeous, showing what a genius uh, Brian Wilson was and in fact uh, is. So that's my number 10, Surf's Up. My number 9 is a posthumous album. This is um, Jimi Hendrix. Great uh, artwork on the front, great drawing of Jimi Hendrix. And this is The Cry of Love. This came out um, obviously, well, a year or so after he died. But this is contains 
some of the material that he was preparing for his fourth LP, his follow-up to Electric Ladyland before he sadly died in 1970. And these are just really, really strong songs. I mean, whether they would have made it in this format onto the fourth album or whether all of these tracks, in fact, would have made it, um, who knows? You will never know. But it showed you that uh, Hendrix had a lot, lot more to uh, to give and, and he developed his songwriting and his singing as well. I mean, I mean, the beautiful Angel, which Rod Stewart went on to cover, of course, is on this one. But great tracks, Freedom, Drifting, Easy Rider, In From The Storm. Um, yeah, good stuff. I mean, all probably apart from the last one, which is a bit of a throwaway, really, really strong. So that's my number nine, The Cry Of Love, Jimi Hendrix. My number eight, yeah, I mentioned Isaac Hayes. This is um, Black Moses, which is the, I think the nickname given to him by the, the head of Stax Records, his sort of record label, um, which I'm led to understand uh, he wasn't particularly comfortable with, but they, w they went with it anyway. And unfortunately, this is a reissue. Uh, because the original cover, the first press and the original cover, uh, opened out into some, a fantastic um, extended sort of poster almost of uh, of uh, Isaac Hayes dressed as uh, a modern day or a modern day Black Moses. And uh, anyway, this is a double album. Um, it's nearly all covers. There's, there's more be uh, Bacharach and David stuff. There's a couple of covers from Curtis Mayfield, some Holland, Dozier Holland. Um, but in a way, um, it matters little that they're covers because he, Isaac Hayes arranges them and produces them and performs them so differently and so much puts his own stamp on all of these covers that, um, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's not that they're not recognisable, they are, but he does make them his own. It's full of extended jams and raps and it's lush, it's, it's heavy and thick and juicy, it's totally over the top. Say a double album, really long, um, and it just gets you in a real solely sludgy, lovely mood, I think. It's a, it's a, it's a great album. So that's my number eight, Black Moses, Isaac Hayes. My number seven, I love this album. Uh, this is Killer by Alice Cooper. Uh, Killer was the, what was it, the second of maybe four great albums uh, that Alice Cooper brought out. Love It To Death, this one, School's Out, Billion Dollar Babies, over a, over a couple of year period. Uh, and it's just a brilliant album. I mean, to me, this sounds like some sort of cross between, you know, you can hear sort of 60s garage band style in there, but you can also, I can, you know, it sounds like some sort of thing from the from the not too distant future, from the sort of punk era. Uh, so it's punky, it's garagey, it's, it's dark, it's weird. Um, you know, it's got tracks like Dead Babies and uh, Halo of Flies. Which is a bit more experimental than the other stuff. It opens with two brilliant, uh, catchy tracks, Under My Wheels and Be My Lover. Um, and then there's a lovely track towards the end, Desperado, which is, a, I think, some tribute to uh, Jim Morrison, who'd, who died just before this came out. Um, but it's, uh, it's great stuff, absolutely brilliant. Um, if you want to look up a great version of Under My Wheels, it's on the, uh, be on YouTube, uh, the, from an old Grey Whistle Test session, um, back then in 71, 72, I suppose. But, uh, yeah, great stuff. My number seven, Killer Alice Cooper. My number six, well, what an album this is. This is Carol King, Tapestry. Uh, I mean, just such a brilliant album. And Carol King had been a songwriter for ten years for other people before she brought this out. Uh, sort of, was this her debut or was it a second album? It might have been a second album, but it seemed like a debut. But anyway, she was uh, she'd already um, penned lots of hits and uh, for, for for other people, but. Um, on this album, what is there, 11 songs or so, and every single one of them is so recognisable. You just, and maybe that's, I mean, I don't play this album a lot, and that's maybe because it's too recognisable. These songs are already 
implanted in our heads as it were you almost don't need to listen to it but when you do if you do need reminding what a genius songwriter uh carol king uh was is um then uh then this is it it's just absolutely superb um and you know it's hard to pick a standout track but the, the, the track You've Got a Friend is just absolutely beautiful, obviously made famous by James Taylor, uh, who does actually perform acoustic guitar on quite a few of the tracks on this, but uh, uh, it's her song uh, and it's beautifully done on this album, along with every other track. So that's my number, where, where am I up to? Six, is it? Carol King, Tapestry. My number five. This is maybe a bit of a curveball that you, you maybe won't have thought about, but but I love this album. This is the Chai Lights. Give more power to, for God's sake. Give more power to the people. Uh, the Chai Lights were a Chicago sort of harmony singing uh, group that were actually formed in 1959, high school in '59. They had a load of hits in the late '60s, early '70s. I mean, I have a real problem with the title of this. I mean, this, like many soul records at the time, was sort of moving towards social, in this case, very, very gently, but moving towards sort of socio-political sort of issues. Um, but, uh, yeah, for God's sake, give more power to the people. Um, I mean, for a start, can you think of any more disempowering concept than the idea of there being a God? But... Uh, Anyway, when you get that one out of the way, do we really want to give more power to the people? I mean, I'm not sure I want to give more power to the people around here. I, I don't know. You know, we'd be hanging people in the streets, public executions, and I don't know. So, um, anyway, I'm not going to start off on some sort of um, political rant, but I'm going to talk about the beauty of this album and the Chai Lights generally. I love the Chai Lights. The the songwriter who wrote every song on this album. Uh, the amazingly talented Eugene record um, um, and it's yeah it's just beautiful the opening track Yes I'm Ready um, the uh, on the second side You Got Me Walking and then the big hit off this album the just gorgeous Have You Seen Her um, and it's just absolutely beautiful this and their follow up album to this are my two favourite Chai Lights uh, albums um, but anyway I've got it in as my number 5 the Chai Lights for God's sake give more power to the people my number 4 uh, <laughs> well you probably from one end of the spectrum to the other um, beautiful vocal harmonies to really dark, bleak, intense, sparse, emotionally draining, bare, you know, Leonard Cohen, Songs of Love and Hate. And this is my favourite Leonard Cohen album. This one was never off my record player from when I was 15, 16 year old. I think I played this album every single day for at least for a year, I suppose. Um, this is, I suppose, this is what you think when you think of Leonard Cohen, this is the characterisation of Leonard Cohen. Um, beautiful poetry, bleak songs, um, and yeah, just just uh, absolutely stunning album. Um, my favourite Leonard Cohen album. Look up my video on my top ten Leonard Cohen <laughs> albums if you're uh, if you if you're into Leonard. But uh, my number four. Leonard Cohen, Songs of Love and Hate. My number three, this is Joni Mitchell, Blue. Um, I have a real ambivalence about this album. Um, sometimes, in fact many times, when I listen to this, I think this is one of the greatest albums of all time. And I, I, I might well have had this at, at the number one, my number one album of 1971. Um, but then there are other times when I think, oh, you know, ugh, I can't, Joni, moaning on about your, you know, I don't know, personal privileged excursions to Europe and feeling homesick from Paris and all the rest of it. And it's, mm, you know, a bit who cares sort of thing. And I, and, I, and I do veer from one to the other. That doesn't get away from the fact that this is, it's brilliant, it's poetic, it's it's great songwriting, 
it's 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 beautifully performed. I think I probably prefer some of Joni's later, maybe slightly less sparse uh, albums, more lushly produced, perhaps more jazzy. Um, but there's no doubt about it. This is a great album. Um, it is one of the landmark albums I think of the early 70s uh, so despite my ambivalence or maybe because of my ambivalence I've put it instead of number one I've put it at number three so that's Joni Mitchell Blue. My number two I absolutely love this album it's my favourite album by The Doors this is LA Woman uh, it's bluesy it's edgy it's stripped back uh, the title track is just absolutely stunning menacing lyrically and musically sort of really really dark and menacing stuff I love the changeling um, L'America is, is, is fantastic uh, the jazzy epic Riders on the Storm, of course. Um, yeah, being down so long on sidewalk. I mean, I just love the whole album. This is a this is a gorgeous version of the album. This is um, this is Analog uh, Productions uh, forty five RPM uh, version of it, and the sound on here is just beautiful, and it really highlights that great. Um, as I say, that great bluesy, edgy, stripped back sound that, that pervades through this. Sadly, Jim Morrison was to die within a, just within a few months of this album coming out. So it was this is the last one featuring Jim Morrison, but um, a brilliant album. I love it. I play it regularly all the, all the time, and uh, it's therefore my number two, The Doors, L.A. Woman, which leaves my number one from North America from 1971 and this is the oh, unbelievable what's going on Marvin Gaye um, which uh, yeah the Marvin Gaye I always loved the cover of this album he just looks so cool in the rain his beard and his and he totally changed his I think he was one of the first soul singers to totally change his image and reject the sort of you know, suits and ties and smooth sort of look that um, was, uh, you, you know, was the, the, the sort of, uh, I don't know whether it was enforced, but it was de rigueur for, for uh, soul singers before that. But uh, a great image and that just reflects the subject matter of this. So this is, this is a, this is an album that is, it's called a song cycle, I suppose, because there's no end between, every song merges into the next one and the themes sort of ebb and flow uh, throughout the album. But this is, this is largely about some sort of conversation with his brother who's returning from Vietnam and finding, you know, basically how fucked up America is, you know, in terms of the environment and poverty, social injustice, racism, war. Uh, and it's just absolutely, you know, although that sounds bleak, this is absolutely brilliantly conceived, beautifully um, sang and, and performed and arranged. Uh, it's just a stunning album, an absolute landmark album. Um, my number one, uh, Marvin Gaye, What's Going On? And I think I said I would I would I would say what my 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 top three across them both would be, and I think I've got to say probably it's my number. This would be my number one right across. Um, second would be T Rex's Electric Warrior, and third would be The Doors, L.A. Woman. But um, as I say, I didn't include some other cracked albums from the time, which I've only got on CD. So like John Lennon's Imagine, like Sly Stone's uh, album from 71 as well. So it's just my vinyl, my limited vinyl collection I'm talking about. But anyway, sorry I'm rambling on. Thanks for listening. Next time, another great year, 1972. Cheers.